Welcome to Beating Cancer Daily. Beating stage four cancer for 30 years still takes my breath away every time I say it. I'm Saren, founder of the Comedy Cures Foundation, and I hope you'll join me for just a few minutes daily for the next 365 days so we may laugh, learn, maybe cry a little as we live our best days beating cancer daily together. I'm so fascinated by the idea that we could eat to not have anxiety and that if we're having anxiety, we could eat to reduce our anxiety. And I don't know about you, but when I was misdiagnosed, and diagnosed with cancer and then told that I had stage four cancer and then told that nothing was working. And that was over two decades ago. I had a lot of moments that I could and did experience lots of anxiety because it's scary. And so to think that I could eat in a way that could possibly reduce my anxiety and then know what I could do to eat if I thought I was feeling anxious, that is a great tool to have in my cancer and survivor toolbox. So I have a guest today that you know if you've been listening to Beating Cancer Daily and if you haven't, you are in for such a big treat I am welcoming back our functional medicine expert, registered nurse, certified nutrition specialist, whole health educator, and certified health coach. Yes, and my friend, Jackie Bryan. Welcome, Jackie. What a topic. Oh, Saren, thank you so much for that great introduction. It is so wonderful to be here. Uh, This is a great topic, especially for your community. I cannot wait. I've been thinking about all day. What am I eating? Am I adding to my anxiety level? Because what's going on in the world today actually made me very unsettled. And I realized I was reaching for salt and chocolate all morning as the news was going on. And I finally just shut it off. I said, I I can't listen anymore because I know I'm making really bad food choices, but I knew you were coming on. And I was like, okay, she's going to set me straight today. Well, I think we are, all of us are prone to anxiety in some way or another. And then we'll just throw a cancer diagnosis into it. And then that'll just topple us over the edge a little bit here because it's really difficult to take care of ourselves when we're feeling anxious. We're sort of in that fight or flight feeling or experience in our body where our hearts are beating faster, our respirations are are more shallow, not as deep, our, our pupils even dilate, our blood clots quicker. I mean, there's this whole uh, physiological change that happens in the body when we're feeling anxious or stressed. And I'm here to tell people first, can't get rid of all the stress, right? But we're what we're going to talk about. I'm I'm sorry, like I'm not able to take the stress out of your lives, but I can say that what you eat and what you drink matter. I agree, and as everyone knows, I started the Comedy Cures Foundation for my chemo chair. My gosh, twenty four years ago to wow. actually have a strategy for dealing with the stress of what I was diagnosed with and all the treatments I had to go through. And comedy is an unbelievable way and comic perspective is an unbelievable way to cope with stress, particularly with your cancer diagnosis. But I am telling you today with all the news that's been coming out in the world, I just saw myself eating things that I don't think you're going to approve of. Jackie Bryan. Food as an emotional crutch. And while today we're not really focused 100% on emotional eating, if people are struggling with emotional eating, these strategies that we're going to talk about and cover today can definitely help. I mean, if we just sort of focus on the fact that what we eat 
what we drink can have an impact on how you feel both physically and mentally. More and more research is now showing that a balanced, nutritious diet can help reduce your risk of experiencing mental health issues, things like anxiety and depression, but there's even more to it, right? So it's saying a nutritious diet can help you reduce the risk of anxiety, but what if you're already anxious, right? What do you do? I'm I'm already anxious, so where do I go from here? If you haven't listened to Jackie's episode that we did on iron, you must go back and listen to that because it blew my mind, Jackie, how you tied in the fact that an iron deficiency can cause many problems in the body, but also in the mind with mood. So I just think that if you, well, if you haven't heard every single one of Jackie's episodes on Beating Cancer Daily, you should definitely start listening to them. Just search expert in the search engine of any podcast um, site that has Beating Cancer Daily pulled up on it, and you will be able to follow all these great episodes. But Jackie, you blew my mind with the iron piece on our last episode. So tell me, what can we do? Well, first, let me say, I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> no, one, no one talks to me as nice as you do. So I, I'm just, I, it's it's such a great honor to to have you think so highly of me. And, and I'm truly honored and appreciated. I am your fangirl. I, I fangirl over Jackie, a hundred percent. People are fanning over Taylor Swift. Eh, Taylor's got nothing on you, girl. Wow, that's quite a comparison. I will not break into two, and I promised. Um, <laughs> so I, I did want to mention, we just said, wow, nutrition can have an impact on reducing the risk of feeling anxious. But there's actually new studies that are showing that even after you're feeling anxious, that if you make a shift to quality foods and improving not only the the food, but the drinks that you're consuming, that you can actually reduce those symptoms. And the biggest challenge is really just what you talked about, Saren, is emotional eating. This is where that kind of ties in. I'm feeling anxious. I need something to eat because it's a crutch. It's something that's going to make me feel better. And in in some misdirected way, that is a way that you're trying to take care of yourself, right? So you're you're eating something that's going to boost those brain chemicals, like the serotonin, the beta endorphins, and the dopamine. It's going to make you feel better temporarily, right? But it's going to lead to inflammation and, and things in your body that are not helpful, especially for our cancer community. But why is comfort food so sinful? I mean, comfort food growing up and comfort food now are taking on a whole new meaning. Like I am really trying to substitute out a healthy smoothie, right? We had the episode on smoothies or mm -hmm. nuts and make those be comfort food. We realized that I was allergic to dairy. So mac and cheese is not my friend anymore, but mac and cheese is so comforting. I can't believe I can't have mac and cheese anymore. Well, it's really funny you said that because it, there's no doubt that the type of comfort food that we consume today is much different than the comfort food people consumed 50 years ago. And it's, oh, I've got a good podcast for us now to do. Wait, 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 wait. All right. She's going to proclaim it. So if you follow Beating Cancer Daily, this is how I get Jackie to keep coming back because she mentioned something and then she realizes it's a podcast and then we put it on our to-do list and then we get Jackie for another week. What's the podcast? <laughs> the podcast is the difference between whole foods, minimally processed foods, and ultra processed foods. And that kind of ties into what I just said about comfort foods, because 50 years ago, our comfort foods were maybe the homemade mac and cheese with a, a much less chemicalized and processed type of cheese and pasta in that, whereas now today, everything's got lots of chemicals in it and, and highly processed, and it's our bodies just don't like it. So 
and crazy sodium. Yes, yeah. Huge. If you've ever looked on that box, <laughs> that delicious <laughs> box that I still crave, I won't say the brand, but <laughs> I, I can't even do the wheat part of it. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to try a vegetable pasta or bean pasta with like a cashew cheese. Mm-mm. It doesn't work. It does not. It doesn't. Blech. Yuck. Blech. <laughs> If we can find different recipes to make comfort food more appealing and give us that that boost that we need, that's really the, the goal. And that does take time. It takes planning. It's something that I do a lot in my home is bringing in some of those really highly nutritious foods. But it also gives people that emotional comfort. Now that we're I live in New England and we're in the fall and that's when we start getting into our chilies and our stews and our soups. And those to me are really comfort foods. Those are really wonderful. So let's go back to this whole everything gets better with good nutrition, right? So we're focused in on anxiety today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about depression or other mental health issues because oftentimes those are things that definitely need to be checked by your medical care provider and things along that line. But if you are struggling with mental health issues, first and foremost, we need to get checked by a doctor. We need to be assured that we know exactly what's happening with you. This podcast is really about those anxious moments that you're experiencing and finding tools that you can have in your toolbox that will help you along the way. And guess what? Nutrition is one of them. Nutrition is absolutely a tool in your toolbox that you can you can use. The issue is, is that I even said it in the opening statement. I said, oh, let's eat a healthy, balanced, nutritious meal or, or a snack. What does that mean? <laughs> Right. I mean, what does eating healthy mean? I understand that. And I was joking in the beginning saying that I was binging on chocolate and then salty non-wheat pretzels, but I actually made a great whole oat gluten-free oatmeal this morning with almond milk and then washed some beautiful organic berries and then put seeds and then cinnamon and made myself a really good breakfast because I did feel unsettled about all of this stuff that was coming out in the news. And I knew that I had to start the day really nutritiously. And because we've talked so much about great nuts and and we've touched on seeds. I integrated that all into my oatmeal. So how do we sustain that through the whole day when we're so busy? What can we choose? Well, I think before we even get into the food, let's just say that we need to be aware, right? So I always use my anxiety as almost a litmus test for how I'm doing, right? If all of a sudden... I'm sort of prancing around the kitchen, figuring out what do I need to eat, or I'm feeling like I can't sit still, uh, something's going on inside. And it's probably not hunger, it's probably stress or something else going on. So I need to check in with myself and ask myself what I'm doing, what's actually happening inside. And then when I make food choices, I need to think about all the aspects of my body and things that would benefit it. And that's what you did this morning by making the choice with the gluten-free oats and the seeds. That's a really important thing. There is new evidence that there are certain types of supplements that can help with anxiety, but that's not something that we're going to focus on today. I'm a food first girl. Like I like to see if we can get it in our nutrition and, and also thinking about the fact that we've got this incredible gut brain connection, right? So if we, if we eat the foods that are going to nourish our gut, then it's going to help support our brain and vice versa, right? So the foods that I'm going to talk about today are actually going to be foods that are beneficial for both the brain and the gut. And that's really important for us to think about. One of the things that I think people need to think about is with this mental health connection, right? If we've talked mental health connection and nutrition, if you think about stress and other mental health challenges that you can have, in your in your life. Many of us, myself included, and I think Saren, you gave that an example, is that we can have a change in appetite, right? When we're experiencing that. And also different types of food cravings. Oftentimes when people are really anxious, they start craving those kind of sweet 
treats, and we need to strategically take back control of our nutrition. So one of the things that I think is really beneficial is to stock your kitchen. Right. If you can stock your kitchen with foods for better moods, I like to call it foods for better moods. Those are going to be the the nutrients that are going to serve you well. And and the time to get these foods is not when you're feeling anxious. You need to have them on board beforehand. So clearly you had some in your fridge or in your pantry before today. I have another trick that I do. So I do have some of these quote unquote treat foods in the house, but I try to buy the healthiest, least processed versions of them. Mm -hmm. So I think I have two kinds of cookies, but they're very, very healthy cookies in the scale of say cookies. And then I like crunchy things. So I have a few different crunchy things. And again, very low sodium, very Mm -hmm. few ingredients, very few processed But I still put those on a very high shelf. So I can't easily get them down. So that gives me time that I have to travel up to get them. So that gives me that pause time that you were talking about. And then I go, okay, if I have to get a step stool to get up there, could I get a healthier choice like a piece of fruit? that's in the refrigerator or something healthier that I keep on a lower shelf. And that is like a little deterrent for me going for the next level of food, which isn't super unhealthy. So that's a little trick that, that I like to do just to play with myself. And it gives me time to think really about what you said, which is, okay, why am I going for that? food up there. What's going on that makes me want to self-soothe by something gastronomic, right? So that's kind of a little trick that I use. And the other thing is certain religions and certain people practice a little prayer before they eat. And based on what food they're having, they say a certain prayer. And I learned to do that in my later life just to be grateful for the food and then say this little blessing over what I'm eating. And that's another way that it gets me to stop and really think about what I'm putting in my body. Because if it's one prayer, it's one saying. And if it's another prayer, it's another saying. And so they're very different. And that gives me a minute to think, oh, shouldn't I be saying the prayer over fruit? Let me put down that junk or that cracker or whatever, or chip. And let me go get the thing that I would say that really cool fruit prayer over. And it's another way that I use to keep my diet really on track, not diet, but the way that I eat, which is really healthful. Usually. I think That's a really great strategy. And I have to say that when you were, I'm not meaning to laugh, but when you were talking about putting your treats up really high, we just had this vision of you like setting all these booby traps for yourself. (laughs) I love the booby trap idea, considering that we're both breast cancer survivors (laughs) and that we want to stay healthy and we want to not have a recurrence. So to call them booby traps is actually doubly funny. Well, having having all these little like mouse traps or things as you're reaching up for the <laughs> as you're reaching up for the food. But I think what you said was beautiful in the sense that it's not just about the food, it's about strategy, right? So this is what this podcast is about. Okay. I'm anxious. What do I do? It's a combination of strategy and nutrition. The first is to you need to eat a variety of healthful foods. If you are eating the exact same thing every single day. That needs to change. Even if it's healthy, we need to bring in variety. This includes loading up on things that are really healthy whole foods like fruits and vegetables, getting enough protein, fiber, and healthy fats. That's something that's really important when it comes to balancing blood sugar. Balancing blood sugar is, I'm going to just talk about that in a few minutes, but hold on to that thought that balancing blood sugar is probably the ace in the house of cards when it comes to managing anxiety. There's been plenty of research. A lot of the research has been done on the Mediterranean diet that shows that when people are improving their diet with whole grains and legumes and 
olive oil that they're seeing a, a, a absolute improvement in their mood. So let's keep that kind of focus. Like whole foods are where it's at. The the minimally processed, closest to nature, the ones that haven't been tinkered with by man, that's really where we want to put our energy when we're feeling anxious. This is how you take care of yourself. You're feeling anxious. These are the foods that are going to help you. And if you've got cancer or some other inflammatory condition, these are the ones that are going to tame that flame. And that's what we want. And that's my expertise is really how do I calm the inflammation in, in the body? You know, the, the second recommendation or strategy that that we can really focus in on is eating at regular intervals. If you're someone that wakes up and maybe you don't eat until lunch and then maybe you overeat at lunch and then you starve yourself until dinner time, that's spiking your sugar. That's spiking your sugar in a way that isn't necessarily helpful. And one of the things I like to share with people is that it also sets you up for binge eating, right? If you're, if you're somebody that, that doesn't eat very often, you may not have a lot of control at the next meal. So I eat probably five small meals a day or three slightly bigger meals and two snacks. Is that good? I do it because it seems to keep my blood sugar more stable because I've had a history of low blood sugar. And that's what I was told to do so many moons ago. And I still do it. I like the strategy. So I like just what you said. So everybody needs to find what's best for them and their lifestyle. So I call it your eating rhythm. <laughs> All right. So what is your eating rhythm? Mine is breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. I don't usually eat after dinner just because it disrupts my sleep a little bit. But that sounds very similar to what you're doing. And I like it. It prevents the dip. When, and the overall spike. And I'm weird. I like knowing there's another meal coming, right? If I eat five times a day, there's something else coming. And then at the end of dinner, it's like kitchen closed, clean up, and I'm done. I don't go back in there. My, the vulnerable time, and this is not, I know we'll probably end up doing a podcast on emotional eating after this, in addition to the ultra processed foods, but everybody has a vulnerable time that they feel weak around food. And that's just because we cannot have the strongest resolve around food all the time. But the most vulnerable time for me is after dinner, right? Me too. Oh my gosh, Jackie, I'm such a night eater. It's terrible. It's terrible. But I go to sleep and don't think about food once I go to sleep. My husband gets up in the middle of the night and eats and eats. He'll make sandwiches. I've never seen anything (laughs) like it. It's a full kitchen. I think I've talked about it before. I found mayonnaise in my hair, nuts, like I can't even tell you what he eats in the middle of the night, but no, but I do love that after dinner eating till I go to bed, but I'm getting so much better at it. I really, really am. Well, you know that if the kitchen's dark and you eat standing up, kind of hiding in the pantry that the calories don't count. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because nobody is nobody's witnessing. It doesn't count. <laughs> I just got that image of, of I just got that image of me doing that. No, it is an issue. I've gotten so much better at it. I used to eat like a second dinner late at night because you know me, I'm a night owl and I love I love to be up when everyone's sleeping. But no, I've really reduced it to just a snack. And I want to say something about the Mediterranean diet because I lived in Greece and really got familiar with the kitchen and what it was like to eat only fresh foods and never processed foods. And it was extraordinary just an unbelievable luxury in a way to have fruits and vegetables that tasted so fresh and to have farm fresh eggs and just animal products, whether it was chicken or meat that was just right off the farm. It was an unbelievable way to eat. So I understand why people love that diet and why there is longevity in those zones. But I want to reduce it down to something that I do here in America that is really simple that I hope people try. 
it's fresh cucumber, fresh carrots, and hummus. Hummus is just so delightful and you can make it really easily from chickpeas. If you've listened to our health builder series, which is with Jackie, it's live once a month where she takes us through a topic live and you can ask questions usually on a Monday. She talks about eating the rainbow. And I look at when I do that, I'm having three different colors of the rainbow just in this one snack. And it really feels luxurious when you have fresh hummus and you're using a fresh carrot and a fresh cucumber. So I want to throw that out there. If you've never thought about it, the Mediterranean diet and you just want to start really simply just having some hummus and carrot and cucumber, it's really a great way to integrate that into your snack That's a great option for sure. And the Mediterranean diet you were just talking about and how you love the Mediterranean diet, but your body loves the Mediterranean diet. So it's important to think about what your body's craving and what it actually needs. If I can just chime in on the hummus comment, I like the fact that you make hummus because as an informed consumer, when you go into the grocery store, not all hummus is created equal. So you want to make sure that you're choosing a hummus that has the best oils in it, not the types of oils that can create inflammation in the body. So that's important to pay pay attention to. Be a Um, food detective. That's that's what Jackie teaches us. Look at all your labels and be a food detective. For sure. So the strategy that I can say but it is not always easy to pull off is to eat your meals mindfully and not rush. And in our society, we do everything on the fly. We're standing up, we're between appointments, we're between phone calls, and we're just shoveling it down. And eating mindfully is something that one can help with anxiety. It just calms things down. I love your idea about the prayer or even gratitude prior to eating, because that actually activates the cephalic phase of digestion. And that's wait a cephalic- minute, say <laughs> that word again not phallic, it's cephalic, (laughs) the cephalic phase of digestion, which is, I know the way you think, Um, (laughs) the cephalic phase of digestion is actually the digestion that starts in your head. And when you think about the food, even by the act of praying or being grateful, it actually gets the juices flowing, the saliva juices flowing. And in those juices or saliva are enzymes and enzymes can actually help break down the food. So Being mindful means looking at your food before you eat it, having gratitude or praying, whatever works for you, eating slowly, chewing well, savoring the taste. Uh, And and that mindful eating will keep you focused and enjoying the food. And also your gut will thank you for it. Um, And that's really important. I'm just going to say, if you're looking for a first step in mindful eating, I'm just going to say, don't eat standing up. If you just eat everything sitting down, that you don't put one bite of food in your mouth without sitting down, that's step one. And It's interesting that you say that because we are in such a fast food society right now. That's just our culture is do everything Mm -hmm. fast. Are you going to talk about chewing? How many (laughs) times you should chew? Well, I I didn't have it in here, but I can tell you how many times, and I know you know the answer because you've heard this before, but when you have a pretty solid piece of food, like a carrot or a piece of chicken, you should be chewing about 20 times for each bite. It's like chew chew like a cow because cows, you just look at cows, they're always chewing and I'm not calling you a cow, I swear, (laughs) but but chewing... 20 times for each one of those is going to be something it'll break it down into a smaller, smaller bites in your, in your system. And that bolus that forms, it will make it much easier to go through your digestive tract and easier for you to absorb those foods, Mm -hmm. which is really, which is really helpful. And again, that's, that's how we can positively influence our gut. If we positively influence our gut, we're going to positively influence our brain and all of those things are connected. There, there was the speaking of just gut, right? Cause I'm a gut freak. 
think I love, I just love talking about the gut. Uh, there are recent studies that have shown that probiotic supplements can help with anxiety. And I'm again, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, go get some probiotics, but you can get probiotics and actually live fermented foods, things like kimchi, kombucha, yogurts, even red wine. I'm not recommending people go drink just knowing that there's different places that you can find these live fermented foods and that those probiotics, those, those live fermented in the probiotics that are in the live fermented foods are really good for the gut and brain, the way that they communicate through that nervous system. And, and they use these neurotransmitters that we talked about earlier, that connection can be something that will support not only the stomach, but will help reduce some of the conditions that can cause anxiety, right? You're basically changing the terrain inside of your body. And that's key. Because of you, Jackie, and the information you gave us on probiotics, I started drinking kombucha and I really like it. I really, really like it. I haven't gotten on the kimchi bandwagon yet. <laughs> you didn't convert me on that or like sauerkraut or anything like that. But I find that to be a really good alternative. Is there caffeine in kombucha? It is. It's made with tea. The kombu- And if I can just weigh in on the kombuchas too, I really enjoy kombucha, but I look at the label. So those of you that are interested in kombucha, just flip over and look at the label. I prefer that it's made with fruit juice and not cane sugar, because what they do is they they put tea in it, which is a little bit of caffeine, not as much as coffee, but it's got a little bit in there. So probably not have it close to bedtime, maybe earlier in the day before lunch. Um, but they put the tea in there. They put some form of a, a sugar, whether it be a cane sugar or in some cases, there's companies that use kiwi juice, which I, I like. And then they put the bacteria in there and then the bacteria actually eat the sugar, the whether it be the kiwi juice or the cane sugar, and then they ferment. And that's how we get the benefits. And you can get billions of live bacteria, which some people are probably like, oh, gross. I'm never going to try that. But that's the type of food that can support your gut and is especially beneficial for anxiety as well. That's a great episode we did. And it was called something like when it's good to eat bugs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, was that was fun. So if yeah. you haven't heard that one, you should go back and listen to it. It was really interesting. I started yeah, I mean, drinking kombucha because of it. Now, can you keep it in the refrigerator or do you have to get rid of it pretty fast? Because you said that with some probiotics, they have a shelf life and you just don't want to be eating dead bugs that aren't doing anything. <laughs> so most fermented, I'm not going to weigh in on the probiotic supplements right now, but any of the fermented foods like the yogurts, the kombuchas, the kimchi, the unpasteurized pickles, all of those, the kefir, those are require refrigeration because that helps preserve the lifespan of the bacteria that you want. But you want to read the labels, right? If it has expired, and you drink it, you're likely drinking some dead bugs, right? Ah. So that's probably, <laughs> that's probably not something that's beneficial. But in addition to these fermented foods that are going to support the gut, that are eventually going to help you calm your brain and help support anxiety, choosing foods that are naturally rich in magnesium and zinc, things like pumpkin seeds. And I've talked a lot about pumpkin seeds in my presentations with my clients in our podcasts. I just get a raw organic pumpkin seed, no salt or oil added. And it just has, it's packed with goodness and really helpful for anxiety. Uh, other foods like salmon. Salmon is a, a pretty fatty fish and it is along with mackerel and some other ones, but I, I enjoy eating salmon. And these are high in omega-3 fatty acids, and those are really beneficial for anxiety as well, those kind of healthy fats, omegas. And I wait, I want to ask you a question. What about farm-raised versus, I think, can we still eat the farm-raised or we shouldn't be eating the farm-raised? It depends on where it's from. Right. So that's actually a podcast that I did put together for us on safe seafood that we can talk about because the concern is 
when you're getting a farm raised fish, it means it's not been out in the wild. So what is it eating, right? What is the quality of the food that it's eating? So we need to know what that is. There are some farm raised salmon that they are meticulous about the nutrition that they give the salmon. And those are the kind of farm raised ones that I would want to eat. But then the the wild caught salmon, that's ones that have been out in the wild that are have a different type of diet. And it's a different type of flavor. Some it's not for everybody. Not everybody loves wild caught salmon. So being an informed consumer with where your fish is coming from can be really helpful. So that's a really good question. But knowing that those omega-3s will support not only brain health, right, reducing, helping support the brain and the cells for keeping anxiety at bay. But the other one is caffeine, right? You just asked the question about kombucha and tea. Coffee can make symptoms of anxiety a little bit worse, right? Because you're, you're, you sort of get ramped up a little bit. And so we want to be able to be careful with that. And if you're feeling prone to anxiety, uh, I know I do this myself. I drink a couple of cups of green tea, organic green tea every day. I love, I just love it. But if I'm feeling wound tighter than a top <laughs> and I'm a little anxious, I'm, I go easy on the tea, right? That's, and it is not only with the caffeine, but refined sugars. Now I don't eat refined sugars. I make that a rule for myself. I think you do the same. I don't even have sugar in my house. Yeah. I do not bake because I, I got nothing. Well, and I think it's interesting because once you give up refined sugars it, it, and you say you go back to it, you think, ooh, it's almost too sweet, right? It just doesn't, it just doesn't taste the right thing, right way. So one of the reasons that the brain is craving the sugar is it, it feeds off of sugar. That's what our brains, a, a good chunk of the, the fuel that our brain needs is from sugar. But the sugar I'm talking about is not the white refined sugar. It's, or the white stuff, as I call it. <laughs> you didn't like it when I called it the white stuff last time, but, <laughs> but it's the white, the white sugar, right? But that's not what our brain is craving. It's craving some blueberries or some apples or some other healthy whole food that isn't going to cause an incredible roller coaster spike of our blood sugar. I'll tell you, I experienced that because I used to love wedding cake. Not only because it's such a happy occasion, but like to punctuate a wedding with a slice of that wedding cake, I couldn't wait. And all the varieties of wedding cake, because I I used to just be such a dessertaholic. And now I get a piece of wedding cake and I take a tiny bite just to be celebratory and it feels and tastes gross to me. Like it actually is gross. Well, it's interesting because that's that wisdom of the body. It's used to a certain taste. I I think, and it's and your body in particular is getting used to the whole foods, the whole clean foods. But I used to think my husband and I were made in heaven for each other. Now, of course, I still think that. But the reason I did was because I would eat the frosting and he would eat the cake, right? So I thought it, there was no waste whatsoever. That's so romantic. My no, we, don't. we we no, were either, the same. <laughs> we were the same with bread. I would skin the top of the bread, the crust, and my husband would eat the inside. And now, <laughs> because we know that I'm allergic to gluten, I, I don't even touch it. But we were the same way, and we thought, "Oh, we're so destined for each other because you like the inside of the bread." And I like the crust. <laughs> I think it's kind of romantic what you did. Well, we're both gluten-free now. So sometimes we'll just have the frosting if there's no gluten in it. But it's okay to enjoy on a special occasion. But I think it's just understanding that those blood sugar spikes can have a significant impact on the inflammation in your body. And a really good strategy for managing anxiety and balancing blood sugar is instead of reaching for those sweets and sugary drinks, consider fruits and nuts and unsweetened beverages, even like fruit infused water or something along that line. Those are things that can help stabilize blood sugar. The other thing I did mention in just a few minutes ago about the omega-3s is that focus on fat, healthy fats. Not only can you get the fat from salmon, right? And other types of fatty fish, but you can also get them in nuts. And if we think that our brain 
and we understand that our brain is 60% fat and that the brain is responsible for modulating anxiety by enabling those neurotransmitters to move quickly and efficiently from neuron to neuron. And while that might not mean much to you, the reason I mention it is that fat helps the neurotransmitters move and perform better, which means the better your brain is performing, the least likely you are to have some mental health issues, right? So you you just, you're staying on top of it. And so there are inflammatory oils and there are anti-inflammatory oils. The anti-inflammatory oils are those omega-3s that you can get from the fish and the nuts and the seeds and things along that line. Those are really helpful. So can you just make a little list for us? so that people know here are some good oils. If you haven't heard, Jackie is an olive oil snob and she belongs to an olive oil subscription and she gets like the best olive oils from all over. I know the secret about you. And so she really does know her oils. So Jackie, can you give us a little hint on what oils we should stay away from and what we should look for. And I can just do it briefly because I think it's, it, it is like a whole science this. And I love, like you said, olive oil because that subscription I belong to also tells me a story. Every time I get a bottle of oil, I get a story about where it came from, what country, health benefits. But some of the oils that are, are green light, like the ones that are really great for you are those omega-3s from the fatty fishes olive, flax, things things in that particular category, even coconut oil. Coconut oil is a saturated fat. It's a medium chain fatty acid, but it has a lot of health benefits to it. It is something that if you've got high LDL cholesterol, you want to be just a little bit careful of. The oils that you want to avoid are sunflower, safflower, canola, obviously any of the trans fats, things like that. Those are more pro-inflammatory. So just know the sources, know where those oils are actually coming from. What about avocado and grapeseed? I see those. Avocado, a lot of these are depending upon what you're using them for. So walnut oil is good, but you don't cook with it. Avocado oil is good, but you can cook with it. Coconut oil. And it, and the reason I say you can cook with it or you can't cook with it is because some of these oils will break down with heat. And once they break down, they become rancid and then they become inflammatory in the body. So that's an important, and again, that's a whole nother podcast. We I do. knew you were going to say it. I just put that fish into the water and I was waiting for you to bite. And then I was going to reel it in and go, oh, we're going to have an oil bite. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good one. But I think if people just, the healthy extra virgin olive oils that you choose, make sure that that doesn't have a lot of extra stuff added into it is, is really beneficial. Those are going to be really helpful for the body. The other, like when we dive back into strategies to manage anxiety, if we even take the leap from nutrition, we talked about probiotics or the fermented foods, getting the the sugar out, reducing the caffeine, having the whole foods, eating the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts and the seeds, getting those healthy fats in for sure. We need to be moving our body and exercising because that is also something that's going to help with anxiety, even just 30 minutes of walking per day can improve your mood. And that's actually information from the National Institute of Mental Health. So you don't need to be out pounding the pavement for an hour. It could just be 30 minutes. And then the other is getting enough sleep, right? So that's huge. That seven to eight hours of sleep can get you into that REM, that rapid eye movement, which is the most restorative of the sleep periods that we've talked about. But sleep is really critical. And then the last one, which I think actually ties into exercise and sleep is stress management, right? So I know that if I'm not sleeping or not eating well or traveling and I'm feeling stressed out, that makes me more anxious. And that's why it's so important to be eating well and doing mindful activities because we're all talking, we're talking today about all the different components to keeping anxiety at bay. And we don't live in a bubble, right? So we can't say, I'm going to get in a bubble and there'll be no stress in my life. That's just not the way life is. So that when you feel stressed, 
if you are eating properly and sleeping well and being mindful and getting the fats in, your body has the tools it needs to respond to the anxiety so that you don't topple over the edge, right? It just gives you a much better setup for yourself, right? And this is, it's all about kind of strategy. And then the, the last kind of, I think, suggestion for lifestyle is staying connected and being social. People that kind of are introverts and revert inward when they're feeling stressed or anxious, that can actually bubble up inside and that can create more anxiety. And that's really not overly helpful. But so finding some sort of an outlet is is really beneficial. And and obviously, if someone is in crisis, they should absolutely seek medical attention. That's really important for sure. There are also apps that can help you track what you're eating. There are apps that can help you track your stress levels. We did our first research study was the Mindset and Metastatic Research Study, where we used an app called Neolf. It's also on desktop. And we used their platform to actually help our stage three and stage four cancer patients track what they were doing in terms of self-care to help their depression, stress, anxiety, and also their self-empowerment. And so if you haven't thought about these apps, they're even on your Apple Watch, there there's Whoop. There are so many ways that if you want to just monitor where you are in this process. And also, Jackie, you do have a private practice and you do work with people individually and you have groups outside of what we do here on Beating Cancer Daily. So if you want to use technology, there are resources for that. And if you want help from a live person, then Jackie's here to help too. I thought of two more strategies that I do in this situation and also to stop me from going right to foods that might increase my anxiety and not give me the most health filled day. And one is if I'm feeling like that jittery eating mood, I -hmm. will go for protein first, nuts or fish, something or nut butter, something that's substantial And if I still feel like I want to have something sweet, then I will have fruit first or a smoothie, like a healthy smoothie that you taught us to make. And then if I still need or feel like I want that extra boost, then I'll go to 100% or 88% dark chocolate with minimal or no sugar and almost no additives in it so that I just work my way. And as I said, if I am at a wedding or I see myself looking at that gluten-free, dairy-free cupcake, and I really am having fantasies about eating it, I'll take one bite and then put it down and see if that satiates me. And if it does, then I'm done. And I really talk to myself before I continue on with that kind of eating. But I do find that if I go for the protein first and then the natural sugar and fruit say that it really cuts all of that garbage eating out. And as you said, really consciously thinking of a diet, I hate saying diet because it sounds like you're losing weight. If I consciously think about my eating habits and I create a day, almost have a thoughtfulness about how I'm going to eat throughout the day. And I'm not just picking up things on the run wherever I am. Then I just eat way better. And if you've ever seen me in a day, I carry around an insulated food bag everywhere I go from morning till night. And I have my snacks in there. And I have most of my meals in there because they are small and frequent. And that way I am not reactive and I'm not dependent. I'm really crafting the food that I want to put in my body because it is my fuel. And so I think that it has helped me 
lose a lot of the COVID weight that I gained, but it also has stabilized my moods. It's made me just happier and just so much healthier. Well, and those are the part of the strategies that we talked about. I think you're carrying the bag, being prepared with your snacks. That's the name of the game in in any of this. So we could probably even call this podcast planning to eat for anxiety, because that's what it is. You need to have the stuff on hand. If you don't have things in the house and you're feeling anxious, you will go grab the stuff that isn't going to serve your body. So I think that's probably the message too, is to make sure you get the stuff in your house, have it set up in a way that there's no booby traps to get it, (laughs) that you can get to it and enjoy it because it's going to help. And I think if I can just leave people with one message, give it a try. If you're feeling anxious and you're somebody that always grabs the cookies or the chocolates or something when you're feeling anxious, try to grab some blueberries instead or grab some piece of fruit and just see how you feel. Stop and assess. And if you realize, wow, this is amazing. I feel better doing this. This is how we start changing a habit. It takes a little bit of time. We start changing those habits and and that's going to help your body heal and reduce inflammation, which is what we want, especially for our cancer community. It took me two plus good weeks to get through my sugar addiction to the white stuff. It really, there were some rough moments there. It feels like withdrawal. We talked about that before. It is is withdrawal. It's not that it feels that it is. You're having a change. And, but once you get through to the other side, you're, you're in much better shape in terms of feeling healthy and your body's so happy. Let's make our body happy, people. Come on. (laughs) And you can't see Jackie, but I can because I'm watching and talking to her on video. Her skin is so beautiful and she just looks so incredibly healthy. And that's what I really wanted to do too, just really from the inside out glow. And I think that's what this kind of eating and planning does for you. And I know that when I had my hair loss from all the years of cancer treatment, and I was very skinny on one treatment and very heavy on another treatment from all the steroids, to just feel like I looked good and to feel good from the way that I was trying to nourish my body and eat it gave me that little boost. And I think that even a little boost when you're going through so much treatment can be a game changer on a day where things are not going so well. For sure. Absolutely. And I love the healing from the inside out. I think it's great. It's not a Band-Aid approach. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real stuff that affects change and it gets to the root cause and it fixes it. And And we have more control than we think. And that's what this podcast was about. When you're feeling anxious, see if you can grab something that's more nutritious, assess how it makes your body feel, and then start changing it one anxious moment at a time. And it helps your immune system because if you're not expending all that energy in anxiety and you are actually giving your body really good nutrition then your immune system doesn't have to work so hard to process the toxicity from those garbage foods with all those additives. And it can really help you and your immune system work towards beating cancer. And it's all connected. And I think that's what you teach us every time you talk to us, Jackie, is that we are one big symphony, not just one instrument. We are for sure. Thank you. Oh, Jackie, did you ever think about that stressed is desserts and desserts is stressed if you reverse the word? Oh, yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is. It is. I love that. That fits right into what we're talking about. It does. It's a perfect, it's a perfect joke for this because it is true. It spells it backwards and it's a little sad too. (laughs) Oh, but that relates back to the sad, which you taught me and that I've never gotten it out of my head about the American diet. Yeah, standard American diet, sad. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming. And I want to offer, if you have a strategy that you're using 
we we call it booby trapping your <laughs> your bad food if you have a strategy that you're using to get through this to have better nutrition the way that we shared today if you have something that's really resonating with you share it with us we love to share your thoughts we love to know what you're thinking and what you're doing you can go to comedycares.org and hit the record button and just tell me or you can go to the contact menu and write it to me and i share everything with Jackie so we we do talk about the feedback that comes in and we'd love to hear from you so have a blessed day and i'll see you tomorrow if you love today's episode then tell the world why because beating cancer daily and our membership circle are both a listener and donor supported experience. So the more people you tell and the more people that join us, the more robust and interesting programs our nonprofit the Comedy Cures Foundation can bring to you throughout the year. I really want you to go to comedycures.org and of course, I always want you to make a donation. It's tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. But what's super exciting is not only can you laugh and explore the comedy there, you can look at our membership levels and find the one that's great for you. And if you're feeling a little bit generous, gift one to a chemo brother or sister or to a caregiver that you just want to help them improve the quality of their day. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. Guess what time it is? It's time for me to read the disclaimer. Beating Cancer Daily and the membership circle are not in lieu of medical advice or treatment. They are for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your healthcare team to review your best strategy. Thanks for listening. <laughs>